Welcome to Stock Talk with Nico Criticos. Today we're going to take a look at Comcast stock. This is ticker CMCSA. Now this is a stock that I own and I'm pretty bullish on this. They do have a couple problems that we're going to get through. We're going to get into that in this video, but overall you'll see why, why I am bullish. So the stock's down 19% this year. It's currently at a market cap of $153 billion. If you don't know what Comcast does, we're going to take a look here and we're going to see what their different streams of revenue are. We're going to see that they're making 53% of their money from the cable business. And then 16% is coming from NBC, NBC Universal Media, 16 from the studio and the theme park, and then 14% from Sky, which is a similar type of service, but in Europe. And so that's how they make their money. The majority of it is coming from cable. Now, if we go to the news for this company, we're going to see a couple things are out there. One is that they are giving access to some of their streaming channels. Um, I guess they're integrating 20 channels into Xfinity Stream. So that's a good thing, I guess. And the other thing is that they're getting a new CEO, which is probably more important. Um he got fired for sexual harassment. And so this could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what CEO they bring to the company. Comcast is a pretty large corporation. So hopefully they bring in somebody with lots of experience and they could help turn this company around a little bit. If we get into their revenue, we are going to see they've done a good job growing revenue at about 7% per year. Not a ton, but this company has been around for a long time and they're doing $121 billion in a single year. So it's got to be hard to grow when you're doing that much in revenue. Net income is not so good, on the other hand. Um, we had, there was a huge spike in 2017, but usually they're, they were doing it about, you know, 9 to 12, 13 billion dollars. But then this last year, we saw $5 billion. So net income has not been looking good. The, one thing that comes to mind is ever since the streaming war started in about 2020, they came out with Peacock and Maybe they're ramping that up and that's causing them to be a little bit more unprofitable. The other things, I don't know. I, I Maybe it's because there's less people. People are probably leaving cable. Maybe they're not make, getting as many customers from cable. Maybe that's what's hurting them. I don't know. So that's where we are with the first two things. And then we get to the PE ratio. And right now the stock is $36 with earnings of $3.60 expected for this year, which puts it at a P ratio of 10, both trailing and a Ford because they're expected to do the same amount of earnings this year as what they did last year. If we go to see where the stock normally trades on a PE basis, you're going to see it's normally at about a 15 with the lowest coming down to about a six. And for some reason it says 30 right now, but it's not a 30, it's a 10 because it's a $36 stock with $3 of EPS. So that looks pretty undervalued to me. That's a great sign. Then we're going to get to their innovation and their moat. This is where I believe this is the company's strong suit right here. This is what I am kind of most bullish about because for one, they own a lot of different things. Number two, after I went to Universal Studios this past winter back in March, yeah, or February, February, yeah, February or March, I forgot. But when you go to Universal, it's, it's pretty much a one of a kind theme park, right? There's not that many places in the world where you can go and experience all the different things you can there. And with that gives them incredible pricing power to how much they want to charge. And there's everything within the park also costs a ton of money. I got one taco for about $13. So they can charge as much as they want. Um, you know, they got rides, they got shows, they got all this different stuff. They got restaurants. There's a bunch of stuff in the park. Then the other thing is not only for the theme parks and the studio business, the streaming services, all the different channels, but also the barriers to entry to creating some sort of, you know, a, a Comcast or an Xfinity type business is not easy to replicate. It's not like anyone can just start up a company and do what Comcast is doing. You know, there's other companies like Verizon and AT&T that are similar, um, but that's really it, right? So this is, I, I like to buy businesses that have a very strong moat, have strong pricing power and have some sort of barrier to entry to where it's not super easy to replicate that business. That's what I like to see. So that's going to get a check. The industry is growing. I don't know where you even want to, where you even want to measure this at, but 
I mean, theme parks is growing. Streaming is growing. Um, now their main business is cable, right? And I don't know. I don't know if you could say that's growing. I, I don't really think that's. Let's see, cable TV. So this says it's growing at four percent per year. Global broadcasting and cable TV. Even though, even though people are more more focused on streaming, I think that there's always going to be some reason people want to keep the cable. My mom, for example, she will keep the she wants to keep the cable. She I've tried to tell her let's just switch to streaming services. She doesn't want to do it because she wants the news and everything else. And so there is that. That's up for debate. You know, if you, if, how you want to describe that, but. Return on invested capital, we are looking at only 6%. Even years ago, it was only 11%, So, which 11% is not bad. But now it looks like they're consistently doing six, not much more than 6%. So that's not too good. Their equity here, we are going to see it is not growing as fast as I would like. For a business like this, because they own so many different brands and stuff and channels and studios and all that, they have a large amount of their assets in goodwill, which I do not like to see. Now, for now, this is actually the best case scenario. This is actually where this is the best type of goodwill you you can probably find on a balance sheet. I mean, they have 159. Now, the good thing too about this too is that in the last three, four years, it's gone from 173 billion to well, you could look at this as a, as a good thing or a bad thing. It's actually kind of a bad thing because if it's gone from 170 billion to 159 billion. That means that those assets are probably valued at less because that's all it could really mean. So that's not a great thing there. That's, but I mean, the the goodwill, the intangibles that they do have, this is the type of company that I would want having it on their balance sheet. Like it makes the most sense. Let's go back down. Okay. So if we're looking at, if they're growing equity, we're going to see it's gone from, it's kind of hard to say because it's gone from 85, 93, 98, and then back to 82. So there's there's definitely growth there, but I mean, unless they come out with this for this upcoming quarter, unless they come out with some great number, as of right now, it's it's a huge drop off from where it was in 2021. So I'm gonna give that a no, but there's different ways to look at it. Then we're gonna go to number eleven. I believe, no, not number eleven. We're gonna go to eight. Number eight. Is it over 15%? Yes, it's way over 15% because the company's only valued at 154 billion. So that's an easy one. Then the share count decrease. Yes, we are looking at a about a 1%, 1% per year in decrease. So that's good enough. Assets minus liabilities, unfortunately not no, because it, it's all about the goodwill. I, I, I subtract the goodwill out. And so that, you know, it makes it a lot harder. Profit margin over 10%. Let's see what their profit margin looks like. 4%. But it's 4% last year, but really it's normally 10 to 12%. That's what we see consistently. So that gets a check. Are cash and re receivables more than their income? Yes, they have about 17 billion in current assets, cash and receivables. And their net income is... You know, they had one year where they did 22 billion, but normally it's a, it's hard to say what they do for net income normally, considering it's gone from 22 billion to 5 billion in the last six years. It's kind of hard to say. I would say the average is probably right here, $12 billion, I would say. So they do have plenty in cash. Healthy dividend, no, unfortunately not. The payout ratio is 89%. That's not good. I'm curious what their dividend growth looks like. Let's see. Well, they're growing it a lot. That's why they keep raising the dividend. They're, I think they're raising the dividend too much. Their return on invested capital is only, what did we say? What did we say? Four or 5%? Yeah, it wasn't a lot. So they're raising the dividend too fast. And then it's over 20 years old. So we're looking at what? One, two, three, four, five. So about a nine out of 14. So to be honest, it's not the... They're not in the best situation right now. It's not the best ran company. Um, their financials are not the best. Their net income is really bad. Their the balance sheet is not the best either, but it's because they have all that goodwill on there. Um, 
their margins, their, their ROI numbers, not that good. But this is my bullish case comes back to the P ratio is very low, pretty much as low as you're going to get because it, it's, it's for the last decade plus, it was at 15 times earnings. Now it's at 10 times earnings. So you're getting a good deal that you don't get too often. You, it could be years before you get this sort of deal. Um, and then you get the the um the mass the massive moat that this that this type of company has. I also notice the more I do analysis for for stocks that have that for major corporations that have huge moats, AT and T, Verizon, um, the airline companies, stuff like that. Those companies, maybe even Apple, those companies, their balance sheets are normally not that good. They're normally pretty. They're normally very leveraged. And I almost think that's because they all, they have such a high market share. It doesn't even have to be market share. It's a, it's a, it's almost like a monopoly where they have such a high barrier to entry that they're they're not worried about competitors, and they kind of feel maybe they feel safe that like the government will back them. So. I because look at Verizon and AT and T; those are uh, good examples. They have horrible balance sheets, tons of debt, but there's not really much for them to worry about because who's going to come and take over Verizon and AT and T? That's not too realistic. So I think this is a similar example to where who's going to come over and take over Comcast? Right? It's 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 probably not going to happen. I mean, they're they're too large of a conglomerate for somebody to beat them. So. It's that, it's that it's the fact they have pricing power. When they own those different, I don't know all the different movies and shows they own, but if you look at the list, it's really long. So if you look at all those different brands and stuff they own, um, that's stuff that you can't easily replicate. So it's it's that. And it's it's the things like the theme parks, it's all that stuff. It's the barriers to entry. So it's, that's what I'm looking at. It's, I believe that leads to a large moat and I believe it's trading at a cheap valuation. And that makes me feel like this is a low risk business. I don't see this stock going down 70% or something crazy. I don't see Comcast and Xfinity and Universal and NBC and everything going under, right? That doesn't, that doesn't seem realistic to me. So if I can get a company like that, that is trading at a 10 PE ratio and that's significantly cheaper than where it normally trades for the last 10, 15 years, then feels like a good investment. So that's my take on Comcast. Thank you for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.